Hey there, it's Greg Otten here with MaritimeGardening.com and today I'm just going to take you around and give you a little garden tour. Stay with me. Hello, I'm here by the sea. Good morning, it's April 3rd here in uh, beautiful spring Nova Scotia and today I'm going to find some squash in my tulip garden. Hi, it's Greg Otten here with MaritimeGardening.com. Hey, so it's Greg Otten here with MaritimeGardening.com. And uh, I thought I'd do a garden update video for those that are following along. It's um, around the end of October. A uh, very cool morning, around 5 Celsius this morning. And uh, a lot of the garden is shutting down. There's still some things going on here. I've harvested these are I got herbs growing along the edge of this uh, these logs here and I've harvested all of them. I have them drying out in my shed. Got some uh, Swiss chard growing here. This this uh, garden bed was all uh, squash uh, during the summer and now it's just a bit of Swiss chard. That's pretty much all I need. That'll keep growing until sometime in October. Uh, the beans on this fence, they're all done. Um, starting to, uh, I'm going to try to do this from this angle because the sun's at my back. Um, this is the bed where I grew uh, tulips and then uh, petty pan squash. So that turned out fine, so uh, they're all done because it's been frost. We've had frost here for over a month. Uh, so, it's, you know, not every day, but certain days we get frost. So uh, I pulled all them out and uh, just covered it with seaweed and now it's ready for next year, ready to rock. I'll get some nice tulips next spring. Uh, this garden here had squash in it. I haven't really dealt with that one yet. i got to put some sort of mulch on that. I'll probably put seaweed on that too. I really like seaweed. I'm going to do way more seaweed this year, I think. Uh, it's a little more difficult for me to get because uh, uh, it's a further drive, but, but it's a little less weedy and I think it just heats the soil up better in the spring because it's dark. Um, this is the garden I had the, uh, the beans in, and uh, so that is now all squared away. There, I did that video where I pulled, uh, cut the beans off. I didn't pull them out of the ground. I cut them off so that, uh, to the greatest extent possible, all the nitrogen that those uh, legumes uh, put in the soil will stay in the soil. Uh, so this is all ready for next year. Uh, still got lots of. Uh, this uh, red Russian or white Russian kale, I'm not sure which. It, um, all of this came from s seeds that I saved from a red Russian kale that I bought as a transplant in a grocery store a number of years ago. Uh, but if you look closely, let's just look a little closely here. Okay. This kale is obviously a red Russian kale. It's red. Uh, this is Scotch curly kale. That doesn't count. Ignore that. But if you look over here, these other ones, they don't have that red color, right? There's no pigment at all. They're just green with white spines. And these all came from the same, all these were from seeds saved from the same plant. So I can't quite explain that, but you can obviously see those. This one has a purple spine, right? Which is, normally red Russian kale has that purple spine. So I don't quite understand that. Um, other than just random genetic variation. Now, if you look at this whole kale garden here, um, you can see that they're all the same height, except for this guy. Maybe I'll, I'll take it from a different angle. You can just see this guy's like a head taller than everything else. Everything else is at this level and he's up here. I don't know why, but this particular plant is just a monster and it's, it's thicker at the base too. It's about twice at the very base of the plant, it's about twice the diameter. Um, so this is a real winner. So I'm going to do everything I can to. Uh, I'm going to leave this guy in the ground, and I'll put a good mulch down and try to protect it so that it can overwinter and go to seed next year. Because I want the seeds from this guy. Not only that, but this this one particular kale plant, for some reason, um, was far more pest resistant than the other ones. I have no idea why. But I don't remember seeing any uh, white fly or, or cabbage moth or cabbage maggot, whatever you want to call that. I didn't see much of that on there. I didn't see much of uh, slugs on it. For whatever reason, this 
one just took off. And it's possible that maybe there was like a bit of really good chicken manure in this patch of soil, but I don't recall. I don't, don't normally do like partial manure applications. I do whole beds. So I think this is just a particularly good plant. So I definitely want to keep that going because wouldn't it be awesome if all my kale looked like that guy? And that kale's it's over two feet high. Um, anyway, kale's going great and actually uh, the last uh, few weeks I found it's uh, tasted better. I mean I've been eating this kale since um, oh I would say late June. I mean what a what a great crop. People talk about fall gardening or planting fall crops. You know I planted these uh, in March in the, those cold frames over there and then I moved them first of May here and by s some point in June I was eating them and I've been eating them ever since and I'll eat these I'll keep eating those these till late November I don't know whenever they just eh, what'll happen is they you know I'm, I'm picking off leaves I'm doing that cut and come again approach to gardening and um, and they grow back but as it gets colder, they just grow back slower and slower and slower. They slow down, so they, they don't replenish what you're taking. So eventually you can't eat them anymore because there's nothing left. <laughs> so um, I'll just, you know, we'll see how far I can get that. But uh, we, we eat out of here two, three, four times a week. We have a mess of kale on our, on our table and everybody in the house likes it. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I've got kale here and I've got these... Uh, Oh, this is kohlrabi greens, and there's those uh, tree collards, which are still going good. And actually, these collards are actually starting to taste good now. It seems like this is a well-known uh, frost really seems to improve the flavor of, of brassicas, and uh, these are no exception. So these uh, tree collards, which are about three feet high, um, are starting to taste really good now. They haven't, I mean, they've been good, but they're just much better. I would say, you know, 30% better in the flavor department. Really good now. Um, and I got to pick them all because eventually it's going to get cold. So I got lots of greens to last me for a while. Um, this bed, uh, what on earth was in here? Uh, I don't remember. Uh, for the life of me, I don't remember. I can't remember now. I got pictures of it anyway <laughs> to look that up. But uh, I had something growing here. I picked it. You know, whatever it was, it was done. Took it out. And so this is this bed's garlic now. I probably have. 40 or 50 garlic uh, in previous seasons and if you see my watch my videos I, I plant my garlic in with other things and uh, for next year I decided to plant just devoted garlic beds just to do something different anyway so this is all garlic now that's all square all my garlic's planted for this year I got a, over a hundred garlic plant I didn't really keep count um, and that's a good point um, I've noticed that uh, I've got garlic here and I've got some garlic outside the garden enclosure over there in one of the holgoculture beds. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but uh, if you like to eat garlic and you eat garlic all the time in, in, your, in your home, um, planting a hundred I, I would say is not enough. <laughs> I harvested, so this year I harvested about 90 heads of garlic and I put 20 of those aside for seed. I figured that would give me at least a hundred, probably actually a bit more than that. And uh, so I had 60 heads, no, I had uh, about uh, 70 heads of garlic for eating. And uh, I've only got about 10 left, <laughs> and it's November. <laughs> so that's not enough to last a year. If you, if you eat a head or two of garlic a week, um, it's just not going to do it. So uh, I might have to uh, buy some more seed stock, perhaps. Um, I would say you need to plant two or 300 garlic. <laughs> If you eat a lot of, if you have a lot of garlic in your diet, which is supposed to be good for you. Um, this is more kohlrabi over here. I think I'm going to take this kohlrabi. I've got some here, and I've got some over here. And I think I'm going to take it and try to pickle it using that uh, lacto-fermentation method that, I've, that worked out so well for my pickles. I have a video coming up soon where I'm going to dig, dig the ones up that I buried and uh, uh, see if they're, uh, see if I can eat them and not uh, die. <laughs> Uh, so uh, it's just a wheelbarrow full of manure. Um, another weird thing going on here. I still got, uh, you know, it, it's it's late uh, October, and I still have uh, raspberries growing, quite heavy actually. And these uh, raspberry, these these raspberry canes were planted one or two years ago, I'm starting to get good yields. Next year I should get even better yields, but these are still still producing. 
and, and fairly well, right? I got a good number. So uh, anyway, I didn't I didn't really know that you. It must be a particular variety. I'm not really an expert on raspberries, but uh, this variety obviously produces <laughs> well into the fall. Um, this is just another bed of kale here, still going strong. Uh, I mentioned in a previous video, all this kale just came up on its own. So these were seeds that were broadcasted over the area the previous fall, and they overwintered and grew. So I might try to plant some kale that way this year, because um, that's a, kind of an interesting uh, way to do it. Just plant your kale seeds in the fall, and that's one more thing you know have to do the following spring. I love being in my garden this time of year because there's, there's no mosquitoes, <laughs> there's no black flies, there's no horse flies. Um, this whole area here, I had uh, potatoes. I did that uh, permaculture principle number one video. And uh, so I, I talked about how I've always got weeds coming in from outside the garden. This is just, just all weeds out there. They're always working their way in. So uh, I decided to just plant things in this bed that goes along the border. Plant things that have to be dug up every year and that way you can deal with the weeds at that time as well. So. Uh, uh, this summer I had potatoes growing along there, and uh, this year I planted, this is all garlic. I put the garlic, plant the garlic about three inches deep, and then I put hay all over the place. So uh, I'll just leave that, and then when I uh, harvest the uh, garlic, I'll deal with whatever weeds occurred that season. Also along the very edge, like right where the bed meets the fence, um, I've got sun chokes or Jerusalem artichokes. So you can see here. These, these are dead um, Jerusalem artichokes. I planted them along the edge there. And uh, again, that's another thing that needs to be dug up every year because they, they can really invade your space. They, they just invade, 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 invade. So you have to sort of aggressively dig them up. So in doing that, you also manage the weeds that are coming in as well because I've got all these other aggressive weeds coming in, the blackberries and different kinds of things that grow in the, the, the field back there. Um, so uh, this was my first year with sunchokes. I planted them in the spring. I got them from a uh, community garden I was helping people with. And uh, I'm really happy with them. I, you know, I, I planted just a tiny amount and I got a lot, a lot out of it. And so I divided them up and planted them all along here. So I'll have a lot more next year. And you'd be surprised uh, how good they taste. You can eat them raw, you can eat them cooked. Um, a pretty low maintenance uh, a zero maintenance perennial plant. I mean, the only maintenance you need to do to deal with sunchokes is to dig them up every year to eat them. So um, that's a pretty good deal. That's pretty good business in my point of view. Um, anyway, so this is all garlic and sunchokes at the very edge. Now I've got the most aggressive uh, plant adjacent to the aggressive weeds that want to come in. So they can sort of, they can duke it out and they can do the work for me. It's all about keeping the work down to a minimum, right? Observe and interact. Uh, cold frames are being pretty much shut down for the season. Um, I got an idea this year, I might do a video on this where um, I put some, just a little, about an inch of fresh uh, horse manure in here, which is full of weeds. And these beds, I've noticed a lot, I, I put, I mulch them with hay in the middle of the summer and a lot of that hay has gone to seed and so there's a lot of weeds happening in there. So I thought while there's still a bit of heat this fall, I would um, cover uh, the soil here with some newspaper. You can see I just, I, this was just blowing around the garden so I stuck it in there. But I'm going to cover this whole thing with newspaper and then put the plastic cover over and I'm hoping it'll get hot enough to germinate all the weed seeds that are in there and then they'll they'll die as a result of having the, uh, the paper over them and so it'll be basically weed free and ready to go for next year without a lot of work on my part. We're charged up, nutrient rich, ready soil, totally weed free. That's the idea. So we'll see how that goes. I'm not gonna. I don't plan to do much uh, winter gardening or anything like that. I I really don't find it. Uh, maybe I'll do it with one bed just to see. But I haven't found that keeping plants in cold frames really makes uh, you know a huge difference in um, in yield. Um, you know, having having six kale plants in here in the winter, they're gonna grow so slowly. Um, you know, it's it's not gonna make much of a difference. I think it's a far more better use of your time. To um, like I've got here, grow a lot of greens in the summer, and periodically um, harvest more than you can eat, 
and package them up and freeze them. And then you can just, you know, you blanch it and freeze it just like any other vegetable. And with kale, especially, you blanch it and freeze it, you can compress it into a little block and uh, put that in your deep freeze. And then you've got kale all winter long. Right, so that's my approach to winter gardening. <laughs> Grow a lot in the summer and save it and, and eat it in the winter and then you don't have to be out here uh, frigging around with cold frames in, in January uh, when things are growing so slowly it's kind of a joke anyway. Uh, in this bed I put, um, I mean this might, I don't, I don't want to feel like I'm, people to feel like I'm trashing them. I just in this part of the world where I live it's, it's very cold in the winter and uh, I don't feel that uh, having a cold frame really makes a huge difference in product. The, the kind of productivity you get in the summer, in the actual growing season, is far better than the kind of productivity you get in the dead of winter when there's not a lot of sun and it freezes every night. Um, you know, you'd have to have something a lot more elaborate than this. Uh, you know, a proper greenhouse to get any sort of anything going. Um, in this bed here, I've put, uh, I p harvested my pumpkins from another part of the garden and I put them in here. Uh, to see if uh, having them in the cold frame will uh, make them more orange. <laughs> my wife says my pumpkins aren't orange enough. Um, you know, because you're supposed to put pumpkins on your front step. So um, the heat's supposed to make them turn orange, so I stuck them in here just to see if that would do anything. Plus this just extends the amount of time I don't have to have them in my garage where space is limited. Um, I think they're keeping just fine in here. I mean, it's just an experiment I'm trying. Um, you know, you, you harvest them in October and then maybe stick them in one of the cold frames. This had tomatoes growing in it, but they're all done, right? This was tomatoes, that one was uh, peppers, and uh, that was eggplant, and the eggplant are all done too. Uh, reflections on using the cold frames to, uh, to direct seed. So all of these cold frames, I direct seeded eggplant, tomatoes, and peppers. And uh, the tomatoes did great. Um, and the peppers did good, like maybe a, I'd give the peppers a C. I give the tomatoes an A plus. I give the peppers a C, and I would give the eggplant a D. I mean, I got eggplant that I could eat, but I didn't. I wasn't having like meal after meal. Anything I plant, uh, I think I've I've been successful if I'm having difficulty eating it all, keeping up with it, right? And just about everything in my garden. That's the goal I have, and that's what I want to see. Um, so I was having difficulty keeping up with the tomatoes. Um, the peppers, it was just a novelty. I got some peppers. Uh, I didn't have, you know, I wasn't pickling them and trying to, what am I going to do with all these pickle, uh, peppers? I didn't have that situation. And the same is the case for these uh, eggplant. I didn't have tons of them. So the egg, eggplant and the peppers seem to need a lot more heat than the tomatoes. Uh, the, lid, the, the cover needs to be on for longer. I took the covers off um, around the 1st of July because the plants were touching the cover, touching the plastic roof, so there's no more room. So I think next year what I should do is once they start touching, you know, with tomatoes, take the cover off, leave them alone, they're fine. But for the eggplant and the peppers, I think once they start to touch the roof, I'm just going to cut the plant, plant back to half whatever size it's at and let it stay in that super heat for another two or three weeks um, and just become a bushier plant. I think that will um, keep them um, uh, in conditions where they're happier for longer because they just love so much heat and and even in uh, July it's it doesn't always where I live where it's coastal and it's fairly somewhat high elevation for for this part of the world um, it's uh, not uh, ideal for such a heat loving vegetable um, over here where I've got a pretty pathetic looking apple tree um, I've got uh, uh, a bed and uh, this is all uh, the bushes are blueberries and I moved some strawberries here um, just to see how they grow here this soil is literally done with the uh, nothing's been done to this other than what is recommended if, for those that have watched the back to Eden video um, nothing's been done here beyond what's recommended in that video I just had the existing soil I put down paper and I put down wood chips um, so I tried planting, uh, I stuck some um, kale and lettuce in here this year and this is like year four or five since I did that and uh, the, soil, the soil is still kind of lousy and not productive but I thought maybe if I put strawberries in because their roots go fairly deep and uh, you know they, uh, 
they get well established and um, maybe the strawberries will like the conditions here better and uh, also it's just sort of a fruit place I've got blueberries I've got apple trees so it sort of goes with the theme right all the fruits over here um, so we'll see how that goes um, out here the root stout here, let's get over here out here the uh, roof stout beds uh, needs a bit of work. I got some plans here. I want to turn at least one of these into a hugelkultur garden and I'm debating whether this this area maybe I should make a proper greenhouse here. I don't know. I dither on this because uh, there's a lot of advantages. Greenhouses are also kind of annoying because they don't get the rain from the sky. You have to you have to do the watering. I find that annoying. Um, these two beds, those that watch the videos where I grew potatoes, the results are incredible. These are hugo culture beds, you know, there's rotten wood underneath all of that. Um, so this one over here I decided to put, uh, plant some garlic. So there's probably about 50 heads of garlic in here. And uh, boy, if they uh, turn out the way those potatoes did, that'll be awesome. And I, I you know, I've read, I've not tried this before. Uh, planting my garlic outside the enclosure, but I'm pretty sure the the wild animals should leave garlic alone because it probably doesn't taste very good to them uh, So we'll see they'll see there be a huge success or a complete disaster <laughs> This one here, I think I might do potatoes again next year I mean, You're not supposed to do stuff twice, you know, you should always move your crops, but uh, oh man They just those potatoes were so amazing. <laughs> I think that's the way to go I'll do the rest of the garden from here so the Sun's not in the way, so all along this uh, bed here, I had uh, potatoes growing, and uh, you know they finished up, and I harvested them all in like August. So uh, I put uh, lettuce and Swiss chard in here. And you can see where I do a video on um, fall planting or something like that. I use that technique for all this stuff here. They've come in just great. So you know, late August is the time to do all that, and. You know, I've got lots of lettuce here, I've got lots of Swiss chard, it's all growing really well. Um, this is the garden I have the cucumbers in, that's completely shut down. <laughs> Not quite sure what I'm going to plant here next year, I'm contemplating stuff, I have to plan my garden out soon. Um, that one had um, zucchini. This other garden has, um, oh, Brussels sprouts and kale and chicory, which I will not grow again. <laughs> I didn't really get much out of that. Uh, it was not a great experience. Um, and the rhubarb, this is a rhubarb bed here. That's done. Uh, all the strawberries are finally slowing down. So we were harvesting strawberries and making jam right up until two weeks ago. Right up until the middle of uh, October. But uh, And there still are some flowers and there's still some strawberries, but they don't taste as good and they've really kind of shut down. So uh, I'll cover this whole thing with either seaweed or hay in, uh, oh, maybe middle to late November. I'll just cover the whole thing and uh, the strawberries will push up through next year. Uh, this is the garden where I planted all that uh, lettuce and look at it still going on strong. And I mean, all the lettuce in this bed was just like I literally just threw some seeds on the ground over here, and as they came up, I thinned them and moved them. And even a um, good deal of the lettuce that's over here was just moved from, from, from that bed over there. So um, I got a lot out of a handful of seeds. And there's some Swiss chard growing there as well. Um, but yeah, this garden's been really good. I mean, I planted potatoes here, and then when the potatoes came out, I planted greens. And uh, I mean, these are healthy looking plants, <laughs> right? Um, no fertilizer added, just uh, just hay. Just it's basically like a Ruth Stout type thing. Or back to Eden or permaculture, however you want to describe it or whatever term you want to use. Got tons of uh, parsley here. That's coming in great. Uh, this is a bed of uh, beans. They're done. And this is a bed of, this was uh, tomatoes. And they're done. So I've, I've packed this up and closed it away, right? So I pulled the tomatoes out. And they had a bit of blight, so I just fired them in the woods over there. I didn't want to compost them. And I covered it in seaweed. So plant something else there next year. Last year I had potatoes. This year I had tomatoes. So next year I should plant something that's not a nightshade here. Some, some other plant. Maybe a green, or maybe I'll put uh, beans in there to sort of recharge the soil a bit. I don't know. No idea. Uh, this is a whole bed here of... Um, 
parsnips. I don't even harvest these till December. The longer you leave them, the colder it gets, the better they taste. Um, this bed has a, it's got a lot of weeds, but there's a number of things in this kale and beets and some different things like that. And I'm just chipping, chipping away at it, making pickles and uh, cooking the different things that are still growing there. And this is that uh, incredibly weedy bed of, um, get my shadow out of the way here. This is that incredibly weedy bed of uh, carrots um, that despite the weeds uh, has yielded an incredible amount of carrots. I mean, we eat carrots um, all the time. And uh, we've been eating carrots all the time since, uh, oh, I'd say July, uh, sometime in July. And uh, um, I would say I've stopped thinning it and I'm just like taking big hunks. So I've used about a, I got about two thirds left. So, I'll, you know, maybe in a few weeks I'll harvest them all and store them. I'm not going to store these till the last possible minute, the longer you wait, they're, they're still growing. I mean, they're not, it's not like they're turning brown and dying. They're still growing, so why would I stop that? Um, you, know, you might as well let them grow as much as they can and then store them, right? So, yeah, I'll wait you know, probably till maybe December before I actually pull them all out of the ground and put this bed away because they're still growing. They're still getting better. And the frost and all that sort of stuff really improves the flavor of things like uh, carrots and parsnips. All right, so just a, a garden tour for those that are sort of following along and that are interesting. And it's a bit of a long-winded uh, dragging on video, but uh, uh, some people like a good look at everything. So there you go. There's a good look at everything, what's going on here and, and where I am at this stage in the year. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you enjoy this content, uh, like us on Facebook, uh, like us on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, and check out the podcast, MaritimeGardening.com. Until next time. Get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching.